And we'll be getting started here in just a moment. We've got several people still coming in from the waiting room. So we're gonna give them a moment to get settled into the room and then we will get everything going for the conversation this morning. So just be patient with us as we allow so many people into the room all at once. And my side looks like most people are in. So let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, Montana. If you have your coffee mug this morning or hot tea, whatever you're drinking, let's raise a glass. I guess you can't see mine. There it is. It's a coffee talk this morning. So can you believe the conference week is here? We're kicking it off. Yesterday was a great start to the conference. Today is the official beginning, and we are looking forward to a really great day. So thank you for joining us this early. Um, we are excited to have everyone here this morning. So this morning we are pleased to have Jay Wilkinson with us to lead a conversation about what we need to know now with our guest, Randy Hawthorne, Executive Director of the Nonprofit Hub, this, to discuss all those hot topics affecting nonprofit organizations with a focus on best practices on leading your organization in the aftermath of COVID. My name is Michael Hale, and I am the Operations Manager here at MA. My colleague Shelby Rogala, Director of Professional and Organizational Develop is, Development, is also on the line, and we will, we will be moderating the conversation as best we can. Um, we do want this to be interactive and engaging with Jay and Randy, um, and they are hoping for some free form. So please, as they get further into the conversation and start soliciting your feedback, your questions, type those into the chat raise your digital hand, um, let them recognize you, or just be brave, unmute yourself and speak up when there's that pregnant pause of silence. Um, we'll have multiple people jumping in sometimes, so we'll just do our best. Um, and if closed captions are helpful to you, please use the subtitles button found in the lower right of your Zoom options bar. Uh, with that, let's welcome Jay and Randy to this coffee talk. Michael, thank you so much and welcome everyone to this morning's session. Thank you for getting up so early with us to have some conversations around uh, just what's happening now around the nonprofit landscape. Uh, for those uh, of you that um, have been around the uh, Montana Nonprofit Association a while, I've been um, part of several of the conferences in the past. And I, will, I, will, I wanna start by just saying thank you to Michael, to Shelby, to Liz, uh, the entire crew, um, at the Montana Nonprofit Association are really good at what they do. And I hope y'all understand and realize how fortunate Montana is to have such an amazing group of people stewarding uh, the uh, nonprofit landscape. Uh, as part of my job, uh, I, get to, uh, I get to go to a lot of places and talk to a lot of different nonprofit groups and I get exposed to a lot of statewide organizations and I can tell you, this is hopefully this is not a secret for you, but you guys are very, very fortunate, very lucky to have the team and the group of people you, you do uh, doing what they do. I also just want to share a little bit at the beginning of this session today. I have a, um, a kind of a special connection to Montana. Uh, my, uh, my, my wife's father, this is sad. I'm starting to start off on such a sad note, but there's a, a, a happy part to this. My wife's father, uh, died of COVID um, on July 3rd. It, uh, it's been a really, really difficult summer for her. Um, and one, one thing that was like a silver lining that came out of this whole thing for my wife and I uh, was a trip that we took in the days that followed her father's death to Montana to visit her relatives, most of whom she had never met. Um, they uh, are mostly living up in, in and around the Billings area. Um, actually, her, her grandparents emigrated from Malbec, Belgium, into the Billings area to become uh, sugar beet farmers, which is a really hard life. And uh, uh, my wife's father grew up doing that, realized that's not what he wanted to do, joined the Air Force, and then spent the rest of his life um, moving all over and ended up settling in Texas, where he just passed away again on, on July 3rd. But that opportunity for us to come up and connect uh, with her family so deeply was really, um, again, a silver lining for everything. And here's one of the things, if you were at the conference last year, you may remember I, I mentioned my middle name is Cohagen. My son 
his oldest, his, my, my son, my oldest son is, this is kind of crazy to me because I don't feel like it's possible that um, this could happen in my life. But my son uh, turns 30 years old today. Today is his 30th birthday. And his name is Cohagen. And you may be aware and familiar. I printed this out because I, did, I didn't want to do screen share stuff. But you may be aware um, that there's a little town in the middle of Montana called Cohagen, Montana, that literally is out in the middle of, of everywhere. It's in the middle of the vast prairie. And um, my wife and I pulled our RV up into Jordan, Montana, um, and spent the night there. And uh, I got uh, one of my favorite shots of all time. I was a little grizzled, you know, from being on the road for so long um, in beautiful Cohagen, Montana. And I found out that I didn't realize this. I knew that there was a post office because I'd seen the photographs. I'd seen the photographs of the, uh, uh, of the Cohagen bar sign. I didn't realize there was still an active school there. So we had an opportunity um, to chat with the school teacher who still has several um, I think she has 12 or 13 students who come, who, who, who attends her school. We had a, a, an amazing hour long conversation with her. Um, and so I, I've joked for my entire adult life since I was 10 years old, my grandma Cohagen told me that, uh, of this town in Montana called Cohagen. And she had me convinced that it was named after like our family, which it wasn't, it has nothing to do with our family, but there's such a, it's, it's just not such, it's not a, a common name. So I joked my entire adult life that that's where I was going to retire. I have concluded after visiting Cohagen, Montana, that that will not be my retirement spot. Uh, there are literally two houses in Cohagen. The school teacher is one of them. And then there's a rancher who lives there. And uh, then the librarian drives in from Jordan, Montana. So it's a, it's a small little place, but I, uh, I had such an amazing journey uh, and I, I wanted to share that with you because it was something that was the highlight of my summer, being able to visit Cohagen, Montana, and uh, today celebrating my son's birthday. It just seems so serendipitous. I, I couldn't not mention it today. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce um, the, uh, uh, I'm going to turn the tables on, on somebody that has spent his entire life um, asking questions, interviewing others. Um, in fact, uh, the, the speakers at your conference here, I think you're going to hear Joan Gary later this morning and Vu Le tomorrow. Um, Randy talks to them on a regular basis. Um, he interviews them and asks them lots of questions. Uh, Randy Hawthorne has been in and around the nonprofit sector literally his entire life. He, um, he was born to be a servant leader, and he has been the president or the chairman or the leader of I can't even count how many dozens of, no, of nonprofit organizations over the course of his lifetime. And around 10 years ago, Randy co-founded Nonprofit Hub, which is an organization that exists to help educate and empower nonprofit organizations uh, with, with information that they need to grow and expand and, and, to, uh, um, and to help them achieve more through collaboration and education. It's something that Randy has been passionate about his entire career. And I've been working with Randy on that project and several others for close to 20 years. Um, he knows more about what's going on in and around the nonprofit sector than anyone I know. Um, and recently, in, uh, Randy uh, made a decision to pursue a, a lifelong dream, like it started in January of 2020, right before COVID hit, of course. Um, he took the reins. Of, a, of an organization that's been in existence for more than 50 years called Launch Leadership. And Launch Leadership is an organization that changed my life when I was a kid. Um, I, when I was 15 years old, I went to their summer leadership workshop and learned how to become a servant leader. And it literally changed the course of my entire life. Um, Randy also attended this as a, um, as a high school student and now, um, is running the entire organization. Again, it's an organization that, that, that teaches high school students how to become leaders in their schools and their communities. And I, I thought it would be really helpful for us, I know it will be for me, to hear from Randy on how he took this, this long tenured organization, more than 50 years hosting these workshops for high school students and training, educating high school students, and had to completely pivot and change everything in his very first year as 
the executive director of this organization because it, it, it wasn't easy, I know, because I'm a member of their volunteer staff and I was able to um, kind of uh, participate in the process from, the, um, uh, fr from a coach's box on the sidelines, but I didn't have any uh, very little input into the changes and the pivots that were made. And I'm gonna ask Randy to start today um, by giving us just a little bit of an up update and background on what launch is and how they went through this, this, this pivot. Um, and by the way, as, as soon as Randy finishes sharing his perspective on this pivot that they went through, we're gonna open the floor and just take whatever questions. So if you have those, start processing them. If you wanna send them across in the questions panel, as Michael said, or raise your hand on the screen, um, I'll, I'll let you know when we get to the point we're ready to start taking those questions. So Randy, welcome to, uh, welcome to the Montana Nonprofit Association Annual Conference. It's great to have you here. Hello, good morning, Montana. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Jay. And uh, and uh, I've uh, I I'm I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. Uh, so you just want me to kind of get started on like where we where we've been and how we got to here? That would be excellent. Okay. So as Jay had mentioned, we've been doing this uh, uh, this uh, student leadership development for nearly 60 years and Jay and I have been a part of it for mm, <laughs> a good chunk of that, not <laughs> 20, 25, we'll, we'll say that, uh, as volunteers. Uh, and, and so uh, what, what Launch does uh, is primarily uh, we have a five-day five day summer leadership workshop uh, and, and we serve nearly a thousand students through the course of the summer. So that, that we break that up into two different five day workshops. We go to a, a, a small campus here in Nebraska, uh, a college campus. So it's, it's not like a camp uh, because, <laughs> because we have all the amenities that, uh, that you would have if you were in, in, in a dorm room. Uh, it's roughing it for me a little bit, but, um, but, we spend five days in uh, small groups uh, with uh, you know about 10 to 12 students uh, and they're broken up by age groups. So we have middle schoolers and we have high schoolers. And each of those small groups has two uh, facilitators. So um, that is what I would do as a volunteer. Jay would do that as a volunteer as well. Uh, and we take them on this personal journey, so to speak. Uh, and we do a lot of experiential learning. You all have done these kinds of things. You, know, you, you have to figure out how to build a Lego from not seeing the actual Lego model, but someone else is telling you this, but their hands are tied behind their back or they can't hear or see or, you know, all the different things that you do. And you have these experiential learning activities. Uh, and then you start talking about, well, what just happened? And then we do the, ha ha, how does this translate to your real life? And how can we make this, how can we make this um, make sense? And how do, how do you personally grow from this activity? And, and um, through the course of five days, these, uh, these small groups oftentimes become fast friends, like lifetime friends. Um, some of my, my, my social network is made up of amazing humans that have been through this program all over the country, which is an important part of this because when we got to this summer, and uh, you may remember this as this all started unrolling. You know, we were promised, you know, if we, if we buckle down, we would be done by the end of April with the COVID <laughs> experience. Well, April came and went <laughs> and we were still in it. And so I didn't think I, I was going to have to do anything to change our organization because we're a summer organization. So I thought, okay, whew, we're going we're gonna to escape this. We're going to be able to... Uh, we're going to be able to go ahead and make things happen. Well, April came, our planning team, and we're all volunteers, uh, hundreds of volunteers that, that do this, but our, our, what we call our workshop cabinet was starting to get a little anxious about if we keep planning in this direction, what are we, what are we going, what are we going to do? Uh, and so I let them keep planning because I wanted to be help, hopeful that we were going to still be able to pull this off like we do every year, every summer. Um, but what I did was call on our network of friends all over the country who have been past curriculum directors, who have put on all these activities because a lot of our activities are, are from scratch. Uh, we have developed them, they're hand, they're hand spun. 
but I, but I called on all of our past curriculum directors and, and I called them ghosts. And they're giving hope to our students this summer. Um, and they, um, they were the ones that, um, that started to plan what would happen if we would have to go virtual. What would happen, you know, how does this thing look? How does this thing look hybrid? Would we be able to be in small groups in different places throughout the state? Um, and, and so we landed on a hybrid, or we landed on a virtual version as, as time unfolded. Uh, we pulled the plug on it, disappointed hundreds of students because they were in their little Zoom boxes for school and they were frustrated with that experience. Um, and we created Home Shop. Um, and Home Shop, because we didn't want to call it Workshop, because it wasn't going to be the same thing, it wasn't going to be the same experience. And of the thousand students, we only got a couple hundred to agree to spend the, some, their, their week with us. But we somehow figured it out. We did the small groups, the co-ops, we did the large group activities. We even did some of the traditional things that you could never think that you could pull off in a Zoom box. And, um, and the cool thing about this is the parents got to see the evolution throughout the course of the week with their kids because the kids would get off their Zoom and they would go talk, to the, go talk to their parents at dinner and say, this is what I did this summer. So part of what Launch is about is helping students to understand how to take their leadership skills out into their community, and they were doing it every night. Um, and we actually had activities where they you know, had to do some sort of community service activity as well. So that is probably a really long answer to what you wanted there, Jay, but that is... <laughs> <laughs> that is how we took something and made something of it and learned a lot about who we were as an organization and the resiliency of the people that we work with. No, it, I, it's not too long at all, Randy. And I think that everyone on this, on this uh, session this morning can identify with how do we, how do we change everything that we've done? How do, we, how do we take everything we've done in the past and do it differently and, and, and figure out a different way to approach something so that we can continue to be good stewards of our mission and our purpose as an organization. Uh, we've all been down that walk and we're all still in the middle of it and trying to figure out what's changing. I do have a really, I guess, an important question for you on this. Um, having gone through this process of having to reinvent the way that you, your, the, the entire organization is structured and you, the way you deliver the services of the organization. What have you learned from this that may be permanent now, that may not be just a, a little change in time that you've done once and now you're moving back to the old way of doing things? What, what have you learned that, that may be um, permanent? Yeah, there's a couple of things I think we will take from this. One of the things as the volunteer organization and all pretty much all volunteer I'm one of a couple of staff members that are paid um, we have a hard time doing year-round services we've always wanted to get into our into the schools and work with students throughout the course of the year but our volunteers a lot of them are college age and they're doing their college work or they're professionals and they're doing you know their their daily work uh, and so we've struggled quite frankly with reaching more students throughout the course of the school year and this proves to us that we can do activities and we can work with students potentially virtually um, through. The, so this, this fall, we are doing a couple of retreats that are all virtual and hopefully that will give more access to more students that we normally can't, that we normally can't reach. Uh, so that's one thing that we've taken from this. The other thing is we, you know, we had to spice up home shop in different ways. And again, calling on our network of um, staff, volunteer staff, I said, okay, we need to have some really cool people come and talk to these students about different things, giving them inspiration for what they may do in their future. Uh, and so we had these great talks from people from Disney and Nat, Nat Geo and Amazon and, um, you know, just, uh, we had, uh, we had a, a Hollywood uh, agent, you know, just different things that people could think that people can think of as great uh, as great career moves. 
And these students were able to ask these questions and have access to those people. So that's something that will probably also continue forward in some way is to, to celebrate the network that is launched all over the country and uh, allow our students that interact with us to, to have access to that amazing uh, network of humans that we have. That's just a couple of things that I think we've learned. Excellent. Thank you, Randy. And, and as we're moving forward um, in the conversation here this morning, if anyone has questions uh, about specifically anything that Randy's been talking about in his journey with launch leadership, feel free to, uh, again, raise your hand or send them across in the questions panel. Um, the, w w one of the things that is coming to mind for me, um, Randy, I remember as a staffer, um, I, I volunteer my time to go and lead my group of 12 students through their journey of learning leadership skills and how to go back into their schools. And um, as, as a staff person that was not kind of on the periphery of all of this, I remember feeling um, almost the point of resignation of like, I don't know how this is going to work. Um, I'm here for you. But, you know, I felt sorry for Randy, I'll tell you that. Um, and I felt sorry for his team of people that were trying to put this together because I didn't think it was going to work. And I'm one of those people that is naturally wired as an optimist. I, you know, I believe that, you know, everything's going to work if you just put some grit and, um, and, 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 and the effort into it. But I was so doubtful about having, um, having this workshop c come off in any way that had a positive experience for these students that were, again, to Randy's point, stuck on a Zoom call. But man, I, I, I've never experienced the depth of connection that I experienced in that group with my, with my 12 students that, that I was leading through this process. Um, never had an experience like that. Um, I, I didn't think it was possible. Uh, you know, the, the, the boxes, the, the Brady Bunch boxes and the Zoom calls that we have and you know, just the it doesn't feel like you can really deeply connect, but it is possible. And I, I, I now believe that, um, you know, that there is a, a different way. And, and I, I believe that we can, um, I believe that we can change that mindset. Um, I do have another question for you, Randy. And, and again, um, if anyone has questions at this point, feel free to, again, uh, uh, raise your hand or put a note in the box. In the meantime, I'm going to ask Randy about um, uh, a, a, a joint um, appreciation that Randy and I both have, and many many people here, uh, I'm sure, have seen the, the the TED talk that Dan Pallotta did years ago about how we have to change philanthropy. We have to change the way that we approach philanthropy uh, by making sure that the people that are running the organizations, um, the the professional nonprofit um, uh, uh, pe people who are running organizations. Um, are treated and paid um, along the same lines as our contemporaries in the for-profit world. Um, and Dan Pallotta, uh, some of his uh, theories uh, are controversial. There are people that push back on them, but a lot of people in the nonprofit sector um, are really supporting what he's saying. But Dan Pallotta has a new book out now called The Everyday Philanthropist. And I know Randy um, has, has been going pretty deep into really learning um, this system. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to come back to that actually, Randy, if you don't mind, and talk about um, the everyday philanthropist and how it might apply to the people that are in this session with us this morning, how they might be able to use those philosophies as a way to connect with the donors that serve their organizations. But before we do that, um, we're going to go to a few questions that are coming across now. I see that uh, Ryan um, has a question. Ryan, would you like to take yourself off mute and ask your question verbally, if you don't mind? He's a behind the scenes kind of guy. <laughs> oh, hello, Randy and Jay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested uh, with many things going into a digital environment. Finding, staffing, and recruiting volunteers just seems different. And I was wondering what experience you've had. Is it easier to get volunteers because it's easier for them to engage in a digital environment as opposed to being in a physical space or is it more challenging? I guess, what experience have you had doing events with recruiting and getting staff and volunteers? I, I think, Ryan, that, that's a great question because I think I'm going to be confronted with that a little bit. We, you know, hundreds of volunteers that we work with, uh, we 
we have, um, and, uh, and a lot of them start when they're, you know, just getting into college. I'm worried about retention of the first year staffers who didn't feel like they could be engaged this year in, in doing this. So we had, a, we, had some, we had some volunteers that just, just couldn't, they wanted to help, but couldn't be based on the fact that we had to change some things. Uh, and so I'm worried about retention a little bit. Uh, we, did, we did just do a new uh, kind of a new staff recruitment um, event. And normally we have 70 people that sign up for that, but we only had about 40 that signed up for that this year. So it's going to be interesting over the course of the next year to see what happens. Now, that being said, the volunteers that we currently have and that are engaged and are a little bit more tenured, they've been absolutely more engaged. Like the ghosts this summer, those were all professionals from, from all, over, you know, all over the country. And they, because I reached out and they had this opportunity to um, build again and be a part of launch. Now they're now that now I see them showing up in other staff events and functions that we're that we're having, um, and they're from all over the country. So it's been kind of a mix of good and a mix of I'm not sure yet. Um, at least in in launch land. So yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think it's going to be something that we're going to really as a as a sector have to be thoughtful about and think through how are we, how are we, um, how are we recruiting? Um, how can we keep people engaged? Um, yeah. And I, I think, I think Randy also, there is um, anyone who follows Brene Brown or maybe listens to her new podcast or has read her books. Um, no, she talks a lot about the power of human connection. Um, and people have a deep seated desire to want to be part of something People want to be connected with others of like mind, um, and and people want to feel valued. People want to 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 feel like that the work and the effort that they put in um, makes a difference. That 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 they're able to create impact, and it's it's the it's the way we humans are wired. So um, Ryan, I think that whenever we can find opportunities in our organizations to connect people. Uh, in a way that makes them feel appreciated, that makes them feel like they're contributing, that, make, that makes them feel like they are in the trenches with others side by side, working together on a, on a common goal, a common outcome, um, that, that we're going to be able to continue to attract really great volunteers, uh, donors, constituents, people that just are overall um, interested in connecting to the nonprofit landscape. The, the uh, I find it uh, maybe not so fascinating anymore, but I, but, but I find it really awesome that Gen Z and even millennials in the, in the, and I would say even millennials that skew younger in particular. Um, so in other words, anybody 20, uh, uh, 30 years of age and, and, and younger have a, have a natural <laughs> wiring for the most part um, that that is a little bit different than the people that that walked before them. If you aggregate them as a group, um, they uh, they we we don't value that 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 age group doesn't value um, uh, things that we used to talk about all the time. Uh, about you know our parents when we left the house said, find a good job and you know make money and uh, pay your rent and get into a relationship with someone and, and have a family and, you know, that the old prototypical way um, that it's pe people find their connection in different ways now um, and are open uh, to, to making their mark and their impact on the world um, in a way that doesn't necessarily tie them to a for-profit business enterprise and gone are the days when we relegated our volunteer time to weekends and um, you know church outings or whatever it is that that happened in the past, uh, those um, we we've seen this massive transition where people are now um, they care deeply about giving back on on some kind of regular cadence in a regular in a regular um, uh, Maybe it's part of their job. Maybe in their in their for-profit job, they're able to give back. I know at FireSpring, we have a policy that all of our team members are expected to volunteer eight full hours or one full day every month. 
and it's paid time off for them to go do that. And that's why people want to come and work for our company is because that's, um, is, is because they have that ability to do that. So uh, I, I do believe, Ryan, that recruiting and staffing volunteers, even though it's digital only right now, um, you know, that's the world we're in. I, I believe it's still not only possible, but it, in fact, it might even be um, uh, a little more streamlined for some of us to, to find those volunteers and those people that are helping. Um, Lori Paulson, if you're on, would you mind taking yourselves off or yourself off mute and ask your question? You bet. I was just wondering how um, you create an atmosphere of hands-on learning or just experiential learning virtually. Um, if you might be able to answer that question for me, thanks. I, I see your leader kit already there, Randy. <laughs> I have a prop. Oh. <laughs> We sent a leader kit to every student and in it was all the materials that they needed to do home shop. We didn't want parents having to, you know, scrounge around or maybe some of our students don't, don't, wouldn't have access to certain things. This was one of my favorite things that I got to do this summer because we hand delivered 90% of them. We'd put them on the front door, ring the doorbell, scoop back 10 feet and you know wave and say hello we can't wait to have you um and and that was one of my most fun things uh because then when i saw them in their little box i was like oh i was at your house <laughs> so um so this had and this had all the little traditional things that we would do like we have this thing with candles that we do every year well we had to do led candles because we didn't want to send real candles and have them in their bedroom with real candles or whatever uh and so we created this experience and i i encourage you if you have time uh to go out to our social media i believe it's on facebook um and if i have time i might put it in the in the uh chat but we have a, a wrap-up video of how this all turned out but the, the the leader kit was the way that we created that that bond so i'm glad you asked that because i forgot to bring that up but that was a key aspect to the success of home shop for sure parents loved it <laughs> thank you Lori, for asking that question and randy and uh gabrielle uh would you like to take yourself off mute and ask your question All right, if I don't hear, I don't hear her speaking. So Randy, the question is, was there any conversation about how to engage students who may not have access to technology or reliable internet at home? Yes, that was a major aspect. Um, Launch talks often about access and about making sure every student has the ability to interact with us. So that was a major concern of ours. And in certain instances, uh, we worked with school districts um, you know, some school districts were allowing their students to have their Chromebooks or whatever for the summer. Uh, we didn't have to get to a point, but we were ready to do hotspots. So um, send, actually sending hotspots in their leader kit to their home so that they could participate if, 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 there, were, if there was any sort of issue. So major, a survey went out, lots of questions to make sure that they were uh, that the students were going to be able to do the things that they needed to do to actively participate in our in our home shop. Um, an, another thing that we were concerned with, speaking of access and everything, is um, we were talking with our volunteers. You know, we train our volunteers to look for a lot of different things in a, in a child's life, but this opened the door to going into their bedrooms, into their homes, and. You know, we were, you know, we were training on how to look for neglect in a Zoom box or how to look for, you know, not being able to, you know, they're not being taken care of, you know, or, or any abuse situation. So that was a whole nother level of training that we had to start looking into um, as we were invited into homes. Uh, so that's just kind of a side note about something that we had to think about differently this year. Thank you, Randy, and uh, thanks, Gabrielle, for that question. Melden Jenkins-Jones, if you are able to, if you could please take yourself off mute and ask your question. Oh, 
Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, what are the most important things, Randy, uh, that we librarians can do to transform from physical to virtual our annual Black History Month celebration of local Virginia authors, usually held at the library? We usually draw 75 to 100 or so people to our program, which is two to four hours. Yeah, I've seen a lot of cool and interesting things. Uh, to, tonight, I'm going to a com going to a conversation uh, <laughs> from uh, from our uh, oh my goodness, I'm losing the, the, the from Humanities Nebraska, uh, and they have an annual conference that they do, and usually the room is packed, and they bring in a, a top a top notch speaker. Uh, and the speaker tonight, I'm blanking on the name, but the book is called Leadership, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so the cool thing about this is, you know, Humanities Nebraska didn't have to get this speaker here. They were able to bring in the speaker via Zoom and, and take care of that. So I, I, I think there's just uh, one of the things that I would say is virtual virtual environments as we all know we all get zoomed out by the end of the day so if you're doing if you're use, usually doing a four hour program you might want to reconsider and rethink that you don't need to do four full hours that we're going to feel like we got enough in you know maybe a couple of hours uh, so so that is definitely one thing that we that we thought through when we did home shop was students don't want to be on zoom for eight hours none of us do um, and so I, I think that's uh, important to think through. Uh, we are getting ready to do a fundraiser and we are using a mix of live Zoom, recorded activities. It's, it's, it's going to be like an old school telethon variety show. Uh, and so we're gonna take this two hours, but we're chunking it up so that it, you know, it has a different beat. So we're gonna have students do live performances, but then we're going to have a recording of a student saying how awesome Home Shop was. And then we'll, then we'll go to a live phone bank where you can call in just like you used to do in the Jerry Lewis telethon days. And, you know, just being creative about thinking through this. We've all become t t television producers. Um, and <laughs> Ryan Dobish is cringing right now um, because he is a television producer. <laughs> and, you know, we have to think through that. We have to think through what do we like about the programs that we're watching? And honestly, look back to the, look back to some of those old time shows where they were doing live performances, you know, t television was more live or look to the late night programs or look to Saturday Night Live and, you know, just think through how, how do we consume television? And that might help you think through how you might put on an event that we all want to come and watch. One, one other thing on, on this, Meldon, is um, the importance, I believe, of uh, short form or even live recorded short form video uh, is, is outperforming what we used to think of as long form video. So it doesn't have to be ornate productions. Um, you know, doing, uh, doing three to five minute uh, reviews of children's books, for example, that is facilitated by um, a librarian and a student or a group of students who have just recently read that book, having a real world live conversation um, about their response to something they just read and, and having um, online book clubs and the ability for people to come and learn from one another about what they just read. Um, I, I've seen libraries um, uh, in, in, on the East Coast, um, I, I spoke at the uh, uh, National Librarians Conference a few years ago, and there were, there were a lot of examples uh, of librarians that are doing things that are not traditionally known um, you know, for the, the, uh, uh, the librarians. Um, for example, they were hosting online trivia nights um, that were focused on characters from books. Um, to get um, kids to come in and, and have a good time. They were um, re recording like DIY videos, um, how, to, how to build something, how to make something, how to create a craft or how to, how to do something. They, they were um, doing um, online poetry, um, whether they're reading from books of, of authors 
um, or allowing children to write their own and recite their own. Um, all kinds of different things that are, are virtual compatible um, where we can get these out um, on some kind of video forum. There are so many, um, uh, if you just sit down and get your mind working on a few things, there are so many options and so many things there. And I see that Laura has written uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin here as well, who's you know, uh, an, an incredible uh, thought leader. Um, and uh, Doris has a lot of content online um, uh, as well. Uh, so uh, Blake Gilmore, would you mind taking yourself off mute and? Sure, thanks, Jay. I just had a question about, um, did you have any kind of digital strategy in place before COVID? COVID? Um, not just really for providing the, the, the digital experience, but for full digitization of things like volunteer recruitment and program management. Uh, we found that before COVID, we really didn't have a good strategy for the digital realm, um, but it really, it, it kind of lit the fire, right? You, we had to define a very well-defined long-term digital strategy um, for volunteer recruitment and all of our program management. And, and we've really been focusing on that now in terms of how do we, um, provide our services in the digital future. That's, that's something that, um, I, as, as you were, I saw that posted and I, I thought to myself, our digital strategy before was, well, we'll put, a, we'll put a camera in the corner of the room and if people can't come to the meeting in person, they can just come watch it. And they weren't necessarily active participants. And the difference now, and I've seen this in multiple organizations that I'm a part of, the difference now is I'm seeing a lot more hybrid um, experiences where if you can't come, you're still an active participant online. Uh, and it, it's, not, it's not necessarily always quite the same, but there's more space given to the people that are online. So I, I, I think you're right, Blake. I think a lot of people are going, oh, wow, this works and we should do more of this. And every organization should really be thinking about how how does the digital strategy play into our organization and how can we give more access? How can we um, have our volunteers um, interact more in that sort of way? Uh, the one thing though that I don't understand is why did the traditional phone call now have to become a video call? I, like that's, it's like, can we just, just, can we just be on the phone please? Anyway, <laughs> that's one thing I've noticed through COVID is we're all now wanting to be seen as we talk. <laughs> Does that help Blake? Yeah, I think so. I think part of it too is just, it's not even just being participating in the meetings, right? It's, it's even um, applying for the program. Like we, we give money to help people with uh, assistance for, for help with animals, right? But all of, a lot of our applications were physical paper, right? They came into the office, they filled out the paperwork, we went through a physical approval process, and really that just doesn't work, right? We had to come up with a digital strategy for filling out the applications and applying for that grant money. And I, just as a, <clears throat> we didn't have a good strategy in place before COVID, and we've really found that we've had to transition that all to a complete online platform. and. Fire Springs helped with that. Uh, thanks, Jay. We have some forms built for some of that, um, but just in general, right, that full program management through providing services, that complete digitization strategy has been, we, we've had to sit down as a board and actually say, look, we have to figure out how to do everything we do in a digital realm. Yeah, we're, we're I, and again, that's, that's something that, uh, we're, we're all simultaneously going through this process of transitioning uh, to straddle this, uh, you know, the traditional ways we've always done things and to be more inclusive on bringing um, the, the community together, um, the people that are part of our organization together in a way that includes digital strategies. And it's, uh, it's going to be different for every organization. Every, every one of us is, um, is on our own path and our own journey in terms of how we're doing that. But so many, so many opportunities there. 
Randy, I want to come back to um, what I, uh, I seeded at the beginning of the Q&A session. Um, and, then, and then we'll finish up with a few, more, um, a few more questions. I see that Brendan just posted one here. But I want, to, I want to make sure we take a moment and talk about Dan Pilata's philosophy in his new book, The Everyday Philanthropist, because um, it is true. It is true that donors are asking nonprofits to, hey, watch your overhead, keep your salaries low, keep your expenses down, put every penny you can towards your services and the delivery of your programs. Um, and, and, and by the way, here's, here's a hundred dollars or here, here's my, you know, here, here's my donation. Um, can you walk us through the construct of what, what Dan's thinking is in terms of how we need to evolve and change from a donor centric world or in, in a donor centric world where so many nonprofits live? Just a uh, real quick show of hands. I'm kind of looking at the grid, but you've got, there's a lot of us. How many know Dan Plata? Have, have seen his TED talk, um, very, he's, he's very concerned with the, the philanthropic world uh, and the whole notion of the overhead myth. And Voulé, um, who you'll hear tomorrow, uh, is a, a huge proponent of changing the industry in, in, in such a way. Well, I felt like we as an industry have been kind of in our own little echo chamber talking about how our donors frustrate us because they they think they know what's best and they just want us to hold hold our um, hold our overhead you know and we shouldn't get paid as much you know we shouldn't get paid to do the work that we do because we love it and all of those sorts of things well the everyday philanthropist is actually a book written for donors and it's, a, it's an easy, it's a small, I, I have props again today. It's a small little read. Um, it's, you know, and it has pictures. I hope it's not too condescending actually to donors. There's actually pictures and graphics and it's, it's really well designed. Um, and, and he wants us to get it in the hands of donors to change the thinking around how, how philanthropy should work. Um, how, you know, we should, as donors, look at acute versus chronic issues and what are we going to give to and the and the book goes so far as to say just so you know um, that you need to basically decide on the cause of your life like what do you want to what do you want to make the most impact on so trust me if you start giving this book out you're going to want to ask your donor for for them for them to be your cause for your life <laughs> for their life um, because it really, it really plays into making the most impact as a philanthropist. Um, and like I said, it's a really easy read. Uh, it's really short. Um, and it, you know, I, I, I'm a, I, I'm a vocal reader, so it takes me a little longer. Um, and I got through this in like an hour. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, just making the biggest impact as donors and stop telling people, you know, the whole notion of, we want you to run like a business, which means we want you to work on your overhead. Stop doing that to our, to our sector. And so it's, it's great because we've been talking about that in the sector for a number of years now, but now there is a guidebook to kind of give to, in, you know, it's, it, doesn't, it didn't feel condescending to me. It felt like, hey, here's, some, here's a good read, dear donor. Um, I, I really want you to think through like how you are practicing philanthropy. Um, and so that's, that's the gist of the book. Um, and it's, it came out right at the beginning of COVID. So it was, uh, it's a relatively new, a relatively new book. I posted both Dan's original Ted talk, which has millions of views, one of the most viewed Ted talks ever. Um, and um, also the name of the book. And I will share with you that neither Randy or myself um, have any royalties whatsoever. We have no connection to Dan Pilata other than believing that his, his messaging is sound. You know, this, this, this notion um, that charities aren't really, you know, we're not really changing the world the way that we had hoped because that's, that's not what the donors are asking us to do. Um, the donors are asking us to keep our salaries and overhead low, so that's what we do. Um, and, and as a true philanthropist, um, a true philanthropist should support the nonprofits that they're giving to by giving them the freedom that they need to create real change, whatever that, that takes. 
And that's the premise and the crux of his positioning. And again, Ed, to, to Randy's point, um, Dan actually created this book with the mindset that this is something that we can share with our larger donors as a way to give them um, confidence in their gifts and um, purpose in the way that they support um, the organizations that they support. So um, there's, the, there's a lot of power there and I think it's something that uh, uh, we can all learn from. Randy, we're gonna jump back um, to Brendan's question. I think it's a really good one um, because it, um, it, it's actually the thing that, that, uh, that, that I was probably the most surprised by in the work that, that we did with Launch Workshop this summer. Brendan, um, would you mind asking your question verbally by taking yourself off mute? Sure. Um, what kinds of things did you guys do to create space for reflection versus reaction in the digital home shop? And then what kinds of things did you learn? What would you have done differently? And Jay, I'm going to actually, because you actually facilitated and you had to give time for reflection, no. I'm going to let you answer this one because I unfortunately didn't get, didn't get to play this year. And it was, it was yeah, that's right. Randy, Randy's pulling the strings, uh, but he didn't get to, he didn't get to get, get in the ring. Um, <laughs> I will tell you that my, my students that went through the process again, uh, we, 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 we go through activities. Um, we work on something as a group together, digitally, all, all online. Um, and oftentimes, uh, most of the time, uh, when we have an activity, we, we pause at some point during and always at the end of the activity, and we reflect on what we just learned, what we heard, what we saw, what we observed, and, and what we felt. Um, and we do those reflections both verbally as a group where we, we talk about it, it's called processing, where um, we, we discuss what just happened, um, and then talk about how that translates to things that are going on back at home, um, maybe uh, in our home lives or um, in school when we were all physically in the same building together and now some are physically back together again. Um, we, we would talk through that, but oftentimes there's opportunity for self-reflection um, or, or um, where, where they go off on their own. So what we would do in, in my group uh, is we would play music through Zoom, one of the great tools that, that you can have, you know, that, that Zoom makes it easy to do, where we could play um, some really thoughtful, meditative music. Um, and we would ask them to reflect on something by writing it down, by thinking through it, and then coming back and pairing them up. And like we would put them into groups of two and they would share with one another. Um, it would deepen the connection that each individual in our group had with each other, but it also gives them an opportunity to uh, hear someone else's thoughts, which are oftentimes very different than what maybe they were reflecting on. But there are other times when, um, when, when the kind of reflections that they're doing are things that they don't necessarily wanna share with someone else. Maybe, uh, um, maybe it's really a deep internal thing. Um, and so, it, it, it was fascinating to me um, the impact that that the uh, that the the organization had and these sessions had on just getting these students to a point where they would open up and share, be mindful and look inside and really um, and really think about what they had just thought, learned, or heard. Uh, one of the things we do is we have them write a letter to themselves. Um, it's crazy we have to teach them how to address a letter because they don't you know they don't get to do that in real life, right? They don't know how zip codes work. Um, and so you have to teach them how to, how to write the letter to themselves um, in terms of the addressing part and, and put a stamp on it. Then six months later, we're gonna, we're gonna mail it back to them in a sealed envelope that, the, that has remained sealed so that they can be reminded of what they were thinking at the time. Um, uh, but it was really powerful and really effective. And I think it is a great question uh, be, because of it's the connection of, of how do you how do you take what's happening in the digital world um, and ground it in what we learned and what we knew in the physically present world when we were all together. Um, we've got to wrap up here in just about a minute or two because we're getting ready to go for the for those that are um, are, are here and that are going on to the next session um, here to here Joan Gary you don't want to miss that session. Um, I do have a question from, from Shelby out, we're gonna address real quickly here, um, from the conference platform. It says, what do you think is something that may have slipped out of the forefront that we need to refocus on? 
Randy? That's, that's hard to answer quickly, but we were in the middle of a strategic plan planning process and that kind of got backburnered. Uh, and we're, we're just now kind of rebounding from the big <sighs> exhale of all the, all the things. And it, 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 for me, it's starting to feel like, okay, we can kind of go to the new business as usual. Uh, and so picking up the strategic plan uh, and making sure that we, we get back on track with that. But I, but I, but I think we've probably all had some of these things that have, have slipped a, away a little bit, you know, dust off those to do those old to do's from before the pandemic and see if there's anything on there that we need to reclaim uh, <laughs> and pull out that strategic plan. If you don't use it on a daily basis and make sure that you're, you're working with that. So. Thank you, Randy. Thank you so much, Randy, for agreeing to join us today. And uh, thanks to everyone who took the time out of your busy morning schedule to join us. Uh, the greatest gift you can give um, is the gift of your time and the fact that you took an hour and put it aside and joined us today. We do not take lightly. We are so deeply appreciative for your time. Um, and hopefully we, uh, we answered a few questions and moved the needle on a few things for you today. I also just want to finish by saying one more time, thank you to uh, to Michael, to Shelby, and to Liz. Um, Y'all are great leaders, and uh, um, we are privileged and proud to have uh, played a very small part here this morning um, uh, and done a little bit of a contribution to this conference. Thank you all so much. Have a fabulous day. Thanks so much, Jay. Yeah, Jay, Randy, thank you so much for this conversation, for your insights into the issues facing nonprofits during this crisis. We really appreciate um, the things that you've shared. And many thanks to all of you, um, if you're still on the line for being here. Um, just wanna remind you that the next session begins at 9.15. Liz will begin her opening remarks um, in preview of Joan Gary. We're so excited. So um, this session will be posted for you to view afterwards on the Whova agenda site. Um, just come to the same place where you logged in this morning and that will be made available for you either later this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, I have three requests for you before you completely sign off. Um, please, please fill out the brief survey for this session. Um, your feedback will help us to curate things for future events. Um, number two, have you completed your census? If you have, have you asked five friends to complete the census? That's even better. And today is National Register to Vote Day. So have you registered to vote? If you've taken care of those things, we certainly appreciate you. And we'll see you in the next session. Thanks so much, guys.